Ooh. Good morning, everybody. Oh, it's a Monday. Mondays are always tough. <laughs> Let me make an official announcement, and we're going to start in five minutes, as usual. Dun, 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 dun. How's everybody feeling today? I finally think fixed the microphone. Hey everybody, hello Vikings. Finally some people in the chat. Um how is the sound? Is my voice comfortably loud and awesome? Sleepy. Slava is sleepy. I'm also sleepy. Uh, well no. I had pretty good night's sleep today. I woke up early, finally getting on a schedule. Sound is good. Sound is great. Good. Good. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> oh, hello, Anya. My sister-in-law is in the chat. The great wife of a great artist named Ilya Oblev. That's my younger brother. I have four minutes till the start, so we're just gonna take it easy. Um, also, some people say it's too quiet. Is it quiet? Please let me know if it's too quiet. I can do this. Better? And Elia is in the chat too. I can bring the volume just a little bit. Tell me if this, this is better. This is all right. Let me listen to it myself. Yeah, the, the sound is fine, guys. So just, you know, turn your volume up. <laughs> I think the sound is fine. All right. Uh, my voice level was usually higher. Well, I got some noise reduction because um, it's usually either crows or today it's freaking orchestra of um freaking chirping crickets to just go wah, 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 when the ultra sound it's pretty annoying <laughs> right i have two minutes till the start i'm really excited for today's lecture um got got my water i didn't have enough time to eat breakfast so hopefully i don't pass out but it should be fun No soup today? <laughs> what soup? What are you talking about, guys? Um, by the way, guys, if possible, um, share share the um, the announcement of the stream on your Instagram and stuff like that. I post it on Valhalla for just IG and my own IG. And just, you know, spread the message because you are the driving force behind everything. And if you like what you hear, you know, let other people hear and participate because this thing is it's not going to happen often so more people listen to it awesome you know but if not too many people that's also okay we're 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 searching it for the numbers but for the quality of people and we have pretty cool people already in uh, in the discord really fun uh just from what happened last week you know we're probably going to do game nights during sundays uh, just like as a community event. And also, good job on 30-minute death challenges. Very nice. Please keep them up. Uh, sorry I don't didn't have enough time today to repost today's 30-minute death challenge onto official IG. But you guys are doing great. Uh, those 30-minute doodles are going to improve your speed and everything else. So, yeah, keep it going. Also, from exciting news, I think one person from the camp got an opportunity to work with Joe Spatterford. So, congratulations. Woo, someone got a job. Hopefully they'll do well. Hopefully they'll go through the trial period very well and everything's gonna work out for them. All right, cool. So I think we're gonna start. 
We're gonna start. All right, everybody. Welcome to lecture number seven. And today's topic is how to tell your story. And, you know, for visual development artists, telling a story a little bit, it's a little bit different from the regular way of telling a story. So the regular way is what? I mean, animation, you write a script, the script is revised many, many times, the dialogue is recorded, and also a way to write a story through writing a book, for example. Uh, it could be fantasy book, it could be, you know, detective story and stuff like that. But we as artists, we tell stories a little bit differently. And what we need to Im include in our portfolio as this dev artist is also is a little bit different. So my today's talk is going to be mainly focusing on us, the visual development artist, and how we need to convince our clients or our potential uh, studios and directors that we can do that. Today, we're going to dive into story structure, how to approach the story, how to think about the story, and how to train the storytelling muscle in general. All right, so I'm going to start a little bit from afar, and then I'm going to work my way uh, up to more specific things and more of a exercise advice for you guys. So, first of all, last lecture and on our Q&A sessions, we talked about an artistic eye, an artistic eye that is inspired by surroundings, is inspired by day-to-day -day life, is inspired by the scenery, by all the, uh, the bad, the goods of our life, the bad people, <laughs> the good people, and so on and so on and so on. With storytelling and, or coming up with the stories, we need to have the same artistic eye on the world. So first thing first is you need to keep your mind open. So this is you, right? And every time you think, hey, man, you know, I really need to step my story, sto storytelling, storytelling game. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not really working for me. I don't know where to start. But you know what? The first thing that you're going to come up with is story cliches, right? And most of the time, the problem with us as artists or storytellers is very often we tell not our story that we don't feel very connected to. We follow on really weird cliches that we think are cool, but when a painting is actually finished or you try to incorporate the story into your paintings, into one or several ones, there's something lacking in it. And most often than not, it's personal connection to your story. So every time I talk to my students or mentees, I say, make your stories personal. Have a storyteller's eye on the world, just like an artistic eye, storyteller's mind, I would say. What does it mean to have a storyteller's mind? So, for example, today, um, I woke up, I went outside. Uh, I, I, usually, um, I usually have a, a little cup of water. I, I live in a pretty beautiful place and I sit on a balcony and I just observe, you know. And today I saw a crow. <laughs> Again, very surprising. It's really interesting. They're so smart. They... They flew right up to me, almost, like maybe five to ten meters, and there was like three of them. And I was just wondering, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Why are they here? What are they thinking? So a creative story brain is usually a brain that observes the reality through a story perspective, right? Everything that you see around you usually needs to inspire you. And through this filter of inspiration, whatever you see then goes onto a piece of a canvas. So a story mind, and the story mind functions this way. And the main the main thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about story, or or you're thinking about how to find more stories around you, 
is have more life experiences, going outside, going for a walk. And I call it an interesting state of mind. It's called wandering mind. It's when your mind is kind of like in the flow state, at least initial st- for the initial story that will come into your brain, it's called the wandering mind. So for example, that's why I like to invite stories into my life. I like to listen to people, you know, from far away. If I'm in a coffee shop, I like to observe people on the, on the bus. I like to go for walks and do and, 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 and question and question myself. What if this, what if that? And now we're going to dive in a little bit into different types of stories. So let's imagine, let's imagine that you have an interesting and wandering mind. Stories come to you organically when you're in the shower. I get so many stories when I'm in the shower or, or, or if you're on a walk or, you, or if you're just sitting. So a wandering mind, what it does or what the storyteller does, just like in the world building, it, you take a little puzzle and then you connect it to another puzzle. You know, and those puzzles can be anything. And now we're coming up to the different types of stories. So let's imagine you're outside and you're looking at something and an idea pops up into your brain. And that idea can be about a character. That idea can be about a world. Uh, In my experience for visual development artists in general, we're going to talk about story structure a little bit later. Uh, I usually get three types of ideas. Uh, One is world driven. Another one is plot driven. And another one is character driven. So uh, what are the difference between those three. Sorry, I'm I'm writing <laughs> character driven. So for me or for our portfolios, right? Uh, clients need to see different things. And your brain may work in all three of those categories or only in one. Most people's brain work in character driven uh, stories. So they figure out a character. It could be uh, a post apocalyptic cat that uh, is in a steampunk universe. And then you go from there, right? You figure out what a character is and then everything else dictates it. Plot driven. You don't even know who your character is, but you know what? Someone encounters something and then this happens and then this happens and this should be an ending, right? So we're going to talk about different types of plots and different cliches or um, I I guess more more famous and often encountered plot uh, scenarios also a little bit later and world driven. My brain usually works most with world driven. It's when my mind asks a question, what if this, then what? And like, for example, for my Lumber Saga story, I came up with a world first. I'm like, yeah, Vikings, North mythology, woods, forest, creatures, blah, 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 blah. And then slowly, when I'm exploring in the world, I start encountering and meeting characters. And it's fun because you have no idea what you want to say, but you are really excited about the world. And you can, you can have your world as your, I guess, main character. And you explore um, a bunch of you know, secondary characters in a scene and you put a Viking in there just for scale and you just explore. Uh, you can have a fighting scene. It's also not about a specific character. It's just about the world and how it functions. Plot driven is a little bit more complex. Usually comic book artists or um, people who watch a lot of movies. They're not very interested about the visual stuff. 
their interest is about the main theme, their interest is about the character development, and they may do a whole visual novel. Like there's a lot of artists on ArtStation, for example, that do a project for many, many years. Um, and the main thing is plot and everything supports the plot and when the character needs to go and stuff like that. And then character driven is you just create a character and you, 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 you let this character live. And over time, a plot may appear or you just like exploring just in a vis dev way, different, different ways this character interacts with the world and everything else. But, but for us to think about each of the type of the story that we want for our portfolio, again, because you need to understand, I'm talking about story, not from a script writing perspective, not from you're going to be the director. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but from purely this dev standpoint of view, you need to understand how your brain works and where you can be most useful. Because if you're world driven and you like to explore vast uh, and you like this super blue sky kind of area and, and, and you just you just like wandering around, you can be hired for developing, you know, environments, for example. And you think, well, how did the world evolve? What happened? What history happened in there? Did they did did they have their own apocalypse or they are they flourishing? Are, are resources there enough? Your world is your character. And then there are some people who like to explore, you know, so this character was this way, then he slowly became a villain. How did that happen? And you're really good at exploring plot. And then character driven, you're like, you know what, I'm not really good with plot and very intricate um, character development and, and everything else, but I'm really good at trying to understand my main character and then going on a journey with him. Those two are kind of similar, but a little bit different. But anyways, so today we're going to explore the main fundamentals of, uh, of story. We're going to go into Dan Harmon's story circle or hero's journey. And we're going to talk about conflict, why it's interesting and why you should always have an interesting emotional arc, even in any in 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 any of those types of approaches, would it be world, plot driven, or character driven? So, let's imagine you have the wandering mind, the wandering mind of a storyteller, and you just started your story. You had an idea. You were walking somewhere on the field, and you got an eureka moment. Wow, this is awesome. You know, and then you forgot about it and then you remembered about it and you forgot about it. And then on one of those moments, you wrote it down. So when I start any story, I like, I like to start really big before I even latch onto something good, like a golden nugget, you know, and I usually ask myself these questions. So first one is what if then what that's one way to start your story and start exploring for example what if what if toys came alive when children are not watching that's toy story right what if people went to next uh, on a, on a on an adventure to find Atlantis, then what? Uh, the Incredibles, what if superheroes were, were outlawed, but there's a supervillain? What if this, then that? What if the whole earth was so polluted and everyone escaped the earth and there was one functioning robot who encountered life for the first time? Then what? This question, honestly, covers a lot of stories it's really really good from this kind of formula you can encounter other different questions which is what is a what is the best character to tell this story and then 
How does this character think? How would they react to this situation or that situation? And so on and so on and so on. But for simplicity sake, let's just have this as our formula for now. And then we're gonna explore different tropes. So you came up with a situation. You came up with say with a character and with a plot, and then you're thinking, man, what do you do next? And another really good thing for you is not only coming up with good stories, but also knowing what stories are out there. So there's different tropes that a lot of literature and movies repeat over time. And I'm going to mention a few. So one of them is, for example, uh, overcoming the monster over, oh man, spelling, overcoming the monster. Anyone can already think of a story? So this is pretty vague. So overcoming the monster, it could be a real challenge, like a sea monster. It could be digging yourself out of, I don't know, poverty, uh, or it could be defeating an evil overlord, etc., etc., etc. Well, I, I kind of went ahead a little bit with <laughs> overcoming poverty. Another trope is rags from rags to riches right so everyone loves a comeback story where we have an underdog and everything wrong happens to that underdog and then he finds success people love this story and then we have the classic hero quest it's it's the finding atlantis story uh well it, it can be paired with another trope which is uh Voyage, voyage, and return trope. So quest and voyage and return, in my book, they're kind of the same. They have a little bit of a different structure, but overall, it's all about the same thing. And then we have comedy and tragedy trope. Comedy from, from, from the Greek theater. Comedy, prose, tragedy. I hope I spelled that right. Tragedy. If I didn't, <laughs> forgive me. Coming deep with tragedy. It's pretty self-explanatory. Usually comedy tropes, like we have someone in love or we have two friends and they encounter something and everything goes wrong. Everything has a comedic twist on it. Um, one of my favorite, favorite comedy movies is, uh, or animation, is, 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 is Mega Brain. Is it Mega Brain? Mega Mind. Mega Brain. <laughs> Mega Mind. Uh, where you have um, kind of like two. It's like overcoming the monster and with a comedy twist. Because a lot of stories can combine a few genres in, inside them. And then tragedy. You know, well, tragedy is pretty simple. You start somewhere, like for example, uh, the Joker is a tragedy story. Yeah, you have the Joker in a some kind of a baseline. He is trying to do good, but nothing is going according to plan. And then over time, everything is not going, and then bleh, everything goes into absolute chaos, and it's sad and horrible, right? And then the last one is rebirth. Another trope that we have is rebirth. It's when the character usually, it could be good, it could be bad. So for example, we can have a bad character, like an anti-villain that turns good, or we can have a neutral good character that slowly turns into this horrible villain, for example. So those are the main tropes that can almost, I, I guess, describe only, almost any story. Right, so the comeback story, the epic battle story versus could be depression, could be emotion, it could be nibble overload or King Orc or a company that is trying to take over the world. Rax to Riches again, like um, what's that movie? It's called um, where there's a guy who takes a, like a pill and then it makes him super big brain. I forgot what it's called in English. Uh, then Quest, Voyage, and Return. 
you know. Lord of the Rings is basically that. Um, of course, they have very little sub stories that can reflect in, in, in those things as separate character development things. But for the most part, Lord of the Rings is a quest of Voyage and Return. The Hobbit is 100% Voyage and Return. And then when we get to the story circle, I'll explain it a little bit more. And then comedy and tragedy, I'm pretty sure you all know. It's that mo movies like, you know, Hatiko, never seen it, Titanic, and comedy, Mega Mind. Rebirth, I think Joker, uh, was there any other? Sweeney Todd could be in that category but i'm pretty sure in your brain you get the main idea so those are the main tropes that you have to keep in mind and maybe your brain is already spinning and thinking where would i go with all of this where does my story fall under those three categories right and how do i want to evolve it this is related more to like a classic way of a story but you still can have a world driven uh um, approach to your art and you can be like what if my world is gonna take place in this story structure like overcoming the monster and you kind of implement that without having a main character for example uh, same thing here same thing here so now to the fun part story structure or story circle uh, there's 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 a few schools of story but over time people figure out basic rhythms basic patterns that were occurring that our brains as humans liked so i'm gonna be using dan Harmon's story circle dan Harmon's story circle story circle what is a story circle it's a little cheat sheet that you can compare your story to or base it upon and figure out if you have a good base for your story so story circle goes something like this and we're going to have many examples so first and you know probably a bunch of people already know what story circle is but it's good to refresh your mind so first, you, station number one, what is you? It's a baseline, it's a character in a comfort zone. So character in comfort. Character in comfort. You can have your world in comfort. What's the baseline for your world? What's the baseline for a prop? You can you can you can come up with a whole story about anything else. Awesome. And you can you can you can make yourself your main protagonist, you can make your world. So anything flies. So character in comfort or in comfort zone. In comfort zone. That means let's say Misha is safe in his apartment with his parents everything is nice and comfortable he has his bed everything is paid for yes there's a little bit of money issues but overall everything is good he's not thinking about much right then there's a need whoops there's a need what is a need well there's a misha sitting comfortably in his apartment in in the middle of Russia, in a, in a little town called Nizhny Novgorod. But then he wants something. And that's actually what I'm going to write down. But, but he wants something. What does he want? I don't know. What did I want? I wanted to become great. I wanted to go on my own little adventure. And I wanted to be become my own man. And my own epic viking warrior right so what i did i went go the next station is go so you go out of your comfort zone they enter your characters they enter an unfamiliar situation 
an unfamiliar situation, right? For me, it was going on a plane alone. It was traveling to America. It was figuring out who I was and what I wanted, right? And then what? All right, I went. Then search. The next session, uh, the next station is search. So I adapt or adapt. So I go into unknown and then the next station is search or adapt. Fourth is search. Search or adapt. I find the grocery store. I find new friends. I feel more comfortable. I start slowly but surely um, learning the English language that I never knew. Right? But I still have that need. I have that need to become great. I want to become my own artist. I want to tell my own stories. So what do I do then? Uh, I find. I find my purpose. I wanted to become my own man. I wanted to become my own Viking warrior. So what do I do? I find a professional called concept art. I find a gang of people that I can relate to. I, I find YouTube channels and everything, everything else. So, and I get what I wanted. I got my purpose. So get what they wanted. So what happens next? I found my purpose. I know the English language now. I'm training in concept art. So the next one is take. Or pay. Take or pay a heavy price. Because when you when you get what you wanted and you take it, right? When you you have to pay a heavy price. And what my price was for it? Well, it was sleepless nights. It was two day jobs. It was endless stress and self doubt and people not understanding me and being alone. That was my that was my price that I paid for it. But then, when you overcome the challenges and the price that you pay, you return. That's the next station. Return. So you return to your familiar situation, almost back. Return to the to their familiar situation. So when am I, why am I back to my familiar situation? Well, I'm back in my computer. Now I, I find myself kind of where I was in the beginning, almost, almost back in the comfort zone and understanding what I want now, because back in the days I want, I, I was just a happy child who didn't, who didn't want or do anything, but then there was a need. I needed to grow up. I had to move out. So over, after all of this. I found what I wanted. I took it. I paid the price and I'm returning to the comfort zone, not returning back to home, but returning to the previous state of mind where it was the previous. Now it's the new baseline, right? Uh, I'm comfortable again. I know who I am and I'm just doing it over here. I was a student. Now I'm an artist, but even though I'm back to my comfort zone, I'm back to it changed so station number eight is change and over here we're going to put having changed all right so this is kind of an example of dan Harmon's story circle we can put any character so right now i just as i was writing i was just doing an example of my life right so if we put any other story like for example let's have fighting atlantis 
we have Milo in the history university. You know, he's he's giving his lectures to those puppets that are supposed to represent his people. But he wants something. He wants to find Atlantis. He wants to be great. He wants to be acknowledged in his uh, college community as a professor of history, and he wants to be great, and he wants to be like his grandpa, right? That's his need. He wants to prove his grandpa right because his grandpa was laughed at all his life, and he wants to give him justice because he's now dead. He cannot protect himself. So what happens is he gets fired from the college of university, now he's jobless. He is super stressed, unfamiliar situation. He gets home and there's a creepy lady. Okay, she's not creepy. She's she's pretty well-drawn lady. Uh, and she invites him on a quest. So he goes into unfamiliar situation, meets the father of his um of his grandpa, and he offers him to lead a mission to find in Atlantis. So he accepts the challenge or goes on the search for the Atlantis and he adapts to the new environments, which is not his regular nerd type of a college environment. There's epic quest guys and super cool engineers and everyone picks on him. But as he's in search for what he wants, he adapts to the new situation. He has to become stronger. And you know what? He finds little clues. He finds little clues to find in Atlantis. He follows the book. He encounters little challenges here and there. But as he finds Atlantis, as he finds Atlantis, the Atlantis is attacked by a group of soldiers that want to capture the crystal. So he has to pay a price. He has to become strong, he has to get wounded, he has to lose some people in the process, right? And what price did, does Milo pay in that, in that story? I don't know. Interesting question, but I'm pretty sure he did, right? Because, well, another thing that you have to know, the story circle sometimes misses maybe a few points here and there, but overall, this thing can apply to almost anything. Right. So then after maybe the price that he paid was disappointment in human beings and disappointment in the person that he admired that then betrayed him. Maybe that was the price. And then after he overcomes all the challenges, he doesn't really return to, 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 to the college or anything else, but a new status quo is there. So now he's in Atlantis and he found him pe his people and he wants to be of value. That's he wanted that's what he wanted to be in college right here. He wants to be on value, he wanted to discover something and be useful to the people and be appreciated. So, when what what did he what did he get? He's now useful to the Atlantis people. He is translating their language, but he has changed. How did he change? Well, He's now stronger. He's more. Um, he's more. Um, what you might call it? Well, he's more brave. He's more confident in his own abilities. He gained what he lacked in this station. But then the, the, that's why it's called circle. Then the circle repeats itself because now he finds himself in a new position which was his old position. Now he's in Atlantis. Now he's brave and awesome and cool and he's useful to the society. But then a new need comes up. For example, I want the world to meet Atlantis people. And then he has to do that. And then maybe over here, he has to pay the price for that. Because of his ambition, a bunch of Atlantis people die. You use your imagination. So this story circle can be used almost anywhere. Let's, you know what, let's, let's, let's run it through again, through another story. Like what story should we run it through? Um, all right, let's do it through Despicable Me movie. For example, uh, we have Gru right here. 
he is a villain who wants to take over the moon. And all the minions go, what do we want? Right? So, um, he wants a moon. He wants to take over the world. That's his want. He wants to take over the moon. And another thing that you need to understand, or part of the story circle or character story, is this. He, there's something that character wants. So I would say want. And there's a need. And usually a want is something, I want ice cream. But actually what you need is carrots for your health. So same thing with Rue. Rue wants to take over the moon or steal the moon to prove that he's the ultimate guy. But actually what he needs, he needs a family. Because he was never accepted by his mom and he, he needs to take care of someone. He needs to be a father. That's his need that he still doesn't know about. So a lot of the times when we go through the story circle, there's a character who wants something, but then they, if they get what they want, they figure out it was all for nothing. And what they actually needed, it was something else, right? So for example, for the Megamind movie, if anyone's seen that, he is a crazy scientist and he wants to defeat metro man but when he does it he loses all of his will to live because he accomplished it and actually what he needed he wanted to be accepted and he wanted to be useful in society and then when he discovered that everything went well so yeah back to despicable me despicable me is here he wants to be an evil overlord he wants to till the moon with the minions so what he does is he goes to apply for a pot patent he wants to get some funding but he doesn't get the funding so instead of getting the funding he gets he adopts a bunch of girls why does he adopt a bunch of girls i don't quite remember why he did that i think oh the main reason why he did that is because um he wanted to steal the moon back from another guy and have them decide as spy. So he adapts a bunch of girls and then they go and he, it's unfamiliar for him. Now he's a father. Now he has to feed them and make so they don't die. Um, so he starts adapting. So he reads bedtime stories to them. He, um, he feeds them. He gets them to uh, basically like fall into a Disneyland and gets angry at a guy who didn't get them the toy and he gets the toy for them. So he adapts to the situation and starts to learn how to become a father, but he still wants to capture the moon. So what he does, he finds a way to do it and he takes it. And he takes the moon and he pays a price for it. The girls that he grown attached to, they are actually being captured. So he feels sorry for that. And then he rescues them and he returns back home officially adapting the children having changed and the change is he doesn't want to steal the moon anymore what he wants to do is he found his real need which is family and acceptance and he finds it so yeah if you want to um run the story circle on your own through any story that you want like someone said lord of the rings or the hobbit for example um Lord of the Rings is a little bit more complex. There's a lot of characters. I don't think we have time for this today. But if you want, do it on your own time and have fun with it. So that's basic story structure. In terms of like main plots, right? So plots. You can connect this story to any tragedy or any uh, or comedy or anything else. Uh, beside a few things that you know, that it doesn't it doesn't end well for the main protagonist, let's say, in a tragedy story. But you can merge this, and then one thing to keep in mind, not every beat will be in every story. Some are going to be skipped, some erased completely. Like, for example, if we have a tragedy story, pay a heavy price for it. And then he dies, epically, you know? It, it's there, right? 
But overall, this is the structure that human human minds or an algorithm that human minds came up with, and it just works. So if it just works, why change it? Why change it? Right? So one thing in mind that you have to also um one thing do you have to keep in mind when you're creating and crafting your visual stories we just talked about things that you have to keep in in the back of your mind things that you have to know you don't have to create a whole script but it's good if this is happening in your brain and you know all of it because what is visual development or story in keyframes or say comic books? Uh, visual development artists usually do keyframes or right, key moments or color scripts and stuff like that. What we do is we run a whole movie in our brain by pressing play, thinking about all of this and then pressing a pause button and choosing the right moment. That's what keyframing is. And when you think about it this way, life becomes much easier and a little bit complex too, because you have to learn all of this. <laughs> but a good visual development artist is a person who can think about the story stru structure, about the main character, where he's going, what he's going to do. He knows all of the cliche and plot points or plot structures. He has a big visual library of real life experiences or story library of real life experiences right and fictional life experiences and honestly for for myself when i'm watching a movie i can sometimes not have a real life but remember when i said visual development artists should have empathy or an ability to understand and feel like other people so that's a crucial skill of a visual development artist because they can imagine themselves as a different person and walk in another person's shoes and that gives them the ability to create interesting stories, interesting plot points, interesting character interactions and interesting worlds, right? So again, structure needs to be in our brain, visual library, real life or fictional life, uh, movies, books, conversations with our friends or things that we observed. They have to be all in the back of our minds and then have structure. And then we pause it as we run the movie through our, through our brain, our imaginary movie. And then we press pause. And then we pick the main cool points from a story. Another really cool example how to um, train this kind of a story mind behavior is watch a movie analyze it from a story structure and what kind of a, um, you know, what kind of a plot structure it's, uh, it's replicating. And then what you can do is make a screenshot of each moment. So at the end of the movie, you have, let's say 20 to 25 screenshots that will tell you exactly everything. Because for us as visual development artists, simplification is really important. So what you can do is just observe the whole Lord of the Rings movie. Let's, let's, let's go on an imaginary you know, thought experiment. If I was watching Lord of the Rings part one right now, I would do one screenshot. Shire, second screenshot. Uh, Gandalf and Bilbo with the ring. Third, Sam and Frodo going. Fourth them in the tavern with Samuels, Gemji, and Merry and Pippin. Then I would go them in the Rivendell at the uh, you not you not simply walk into Mordor. Then I will do Boromir getting killed. And then Frodo and Sam walking on their own into Mordor. What is it with seven images? Eight images. Right. So right now, what I did is I simplified the whole story into seven paintings. So now what I can do if a director comes to me and says, here's the script or you as yourself as a director comes, 
<laughs> comes to your artist self and says, um, and, and you say to yourself, what's the main story to me? What, what's the main points there? there, there, there what are the main points there are? Because the thing is, there's no way you can paint a whole animation short or the whole story. It's going to be a comic book. You have limited time, especially for portfolio building. So what you can do is you can simplify your story through keyframes. And those keyframes will basically tell the entire story to your client or to yourself or to your audience. So yeah, the act of simplification is very, very, very important. Okay, let's say, let's recap a little bit. You have the wandering mind. The wandering mind is awesome. You go... Uh, you real you lose you use your real life experiences, the movies, the conversation, the friends, the games, the bad, the good, and then you hold on onto emotion, and that's another thing that I forgot to mention in the beginning. When you're coming up with a story, a keyframe or an image, each image should tell a story. Should it be a sequence of images or just one image? But every time you are creating a story. It has to be connected to a very strong emotion that you feel when you think about it. It tickles your brain, tickles your soul. You either giggle or cry like a baby in the shower. You know, the amount of times I cried in the shower thinking about a fictional character dying or doing something or having a conversation, I can't even count, you know. And then when you get a hold of that strong emotion that makes you feel something, you have to answer yourself, is it worth creating? Is this emotion awesome? Because if you're not going to experience emotion just thinking about your story and thinking about starting something, what's the point of developing further? And of course, playing the devil's advocate, you technically can start and then discover the emotion as you go. If you say if you're a purely visual person, right? But I strongly suggest before you start anything, have this strong emotional response to your idea because it's much easier to push through. Why? Because you're going to have in your brain this emotion and it's going to be guiding every visual st if step of the way or step of the process to the finish line. And the finish line will be this. Whatever I experienced in the beginning when I just first started doing the painting, the audience can experience it. And that feeling was so awesome that it carried me all the way through to the finish line. And it carried me through how I did a, I did a brush stroke or I did a move composition. I asked myself, am I feeling the same feeling? Not yet. Okay. Push forward or change something. You're on the next stage. Am I feeling the same emotion? No. Ask, ask yourself why you answer it. You start feeling it again. Cool. Push forward until you get to this. And hopefully, if it's awesome and cool, and you have enough of a toolkit and tips and tricks up your sleeve, you can deliver that emotion to an audience that we had way in the beginning in our open mind or wandering mind phase when we're just coming up with the story. This is very important. If, the, if that's the only thing that you'll get out of this lecture is emotion rules and your personal emotion, your personal attachment to your story. The other day, I got a few messages from our fellow Vikings where I saw a story in Instagram and one person says, man, I was giggling all night. I did this stupid sketch, but I was giggling. And you know, I, I replied, that's great. If you're giggling, that's an emotion. It's worth doing. So yeah, please do that. Um, okay, so we talked about the story mind to be open, ask a bunch of questions. If this, then that. What if, then what, All right? We are puzzle makers and puzzle solvers. We can approach from world-driven um, point of view, plot-driven, character-driven. We discovered a, a few plot. Um, kind of cliches or things that are used the most or structures and we went into story structure so now what i want to talk about is 
conflict. Conflict or emotional I don't know how to spell roller coaster, so I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> emotional roller coaster. Okay. Let's imagine this is Disneyland. Um so what is conflict or emotional roller coaster? I'm gonna just show you a simple graph. And this is taken from an interesting talk by Kurt. I think his last name is Wonagat, or I think it's Wonagat or Wonagut. I have no idea. But there's this awesome talk. It's called uh, Shape or Stories. And he introduces us to this. So I'm going to write his name down. Um, so you can all check him out later on. I'm going to link it in the description. And also I'm going to make it a homework for you to watch his one and a half hour lecture. We can do a watch party together if anyone wants to. So Kurt Vonnegut. Maybe it's spelled like this. I don't know. So shape of stories. It's awesome talk. And it really represents the point I'm trying to make. So conflict or emotional roller co coaster. So Kurt does this one interesting thing. He basically um, does this little diagram. And this diagram has a few points. So one is um, good and the bad, and then beginning, and an end, right? So he asks this graph, and then every story that he talks about, he makes an interesting diagram out of them. So for example, let's take the story of rags to riches, you know? So there's this guy, or, you know, let's say us, let's take us as artists. So we find ourselves here, kind of okay, not good, not bad. But then something happens. Oh, we're horrible artists. We are not blah, 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 blah. And we're not worth it. It's too hard. The industry is not blah, blah. You, you find Viking camp. Everything is good. You find a job. <laughs> right? That's the story of yourself, right? Everything is okay. You get into the depression. And you take yourself out of it. So uh, another one that he did is uh, story of Cinderella, for example. That one was super interesting. So we have Cinderella. A poor girl who has nothing and she basically a slave and she just polishes and she is in horrible conditions and she has it's just she has horrible stepsisters and stepmother and I think her father died so the only thing that she has left is her stepmom and then the fairy comes not the fairy comes but then you know she, she she gets some help from uh, the fairy godmother. She gives her advice, and then she gives her the dress, and then she gives her makeup, and then she gives her something else, and then she gives her the 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 the, the, the magical crystal shoes, and then she meets uh, the prince, and then the the clock strikes twelve. <laughs> But she doesn't fall all the way down because she already has memories of this, right? But she falls down and everything is bad again, right? Until it's not, right? So, because uh, they find out who she is and she lives happily ever after. What do you see here? In every story, there has to be an up, there has to be a down. It's... It's, it's sometimes boring when things are like that, even though in Kurt Vonnegut's um, interesting lecture, he has uh, an example of, um, of uh, what do you call it? Um, Shakespeare. He has the example of Shakespeare, and that one is, is, is really fun. Um, so... The Shakespeare story, it's basically, it's a very complex story because nothing is either good or bad for the character. And everything goes 
kind of like this. And then that's where you get like super complex stories that are not super fun to watch, usually, that are existential. We as storytellers, we need to have this. We need to have a roller coaster. See, the, the reason why I said emotional roller coaster is because every time you'll think about emotional roller coaster, think about this graph. What does it look like? Whee! Right? It's a crazy roller coaster. So let's have an example of, let's say, what movie should we get? Mm. Any ideas? Any ideas? What movies should we get as an example? Hmm. Luba, what's your favorite movie? Comparison? Yes. Maybe the Notebook. The Notebook. Okay. <laughs> All the girls out there, <laughs> if you know the Notebook story. Uh, cricks make me fall asleep for their calming. Hey guys, can you hear me fine? Can you, can you guys feel me fine? So maybe, um, yeah, maybe the, the, the life diary. I don't know. Uh, or, you know, what's my favorite movie? Let's have, let's have Iron Giant, for example. Let's have Iron Giant as an example. Um, Pursuit of Happiness, Klaus, Emperor's New Groove. Um, you know what? Let's have Iron Giant because we did watch the documentary and we know kind of what the Iron Giant is all about. So we have a kid and everything is fairly good in his life, right? And then what happens is he finds an Iron Giant. Is it good or bad? Well, we don't know yet. It's kind of... I think, I think it's, I think it's good that he found Iron Giant because, you know, he always wanted something exciting in his life and he found Iron Giant. So then what happens is Iron Giant starts causing havoc and an agent comes to the, to the, te to, to, to the house of the kid and tries to, you know, tries to sabotage him, tries to lock him up, tries to... It wasn't that bad, so it was kind of like here, kind of annoying. And tries to sabotage him and tries to make his life harder. So what he does, he basically uh, gives him a chocolate bar that makes his stomach upset and go to the bathroom. So it's revenge on the guy and now his life is... Now he can have fun with his robot friend again. And maybe even more because they go... Um, and they, they, they travel through the forest and he lifts him up high and it's super awesome and cool. And then what happens? Well, then they go into the forest and the Iron Giant sees how a deer got shot and he almost goes crazy. So that's bad again, right? But then everything is also good again when they go to the, um, to the guy's shop and they just have fun in there and then they pretend that they're supermen but then everything goes really really bad why because the whole town starts hunting the iron giant so everything goes really bad they start hunting him they start chasing him he turns into an evil overlord because his his weapon system starts going online and then a huge atomic bomb launches out, right? And then the boy says, hey, I'm here. So now everything is kind of here. It's back. Not quite because they're still going to die from atomic bomb. But now he's at least not destroying everybody, right? But then what Iron Giant does, he goes, he takes his Superman pose, And he heads, sorry for the shape of that. Uh, and he heads um, at first as Superman would to the rocket, right? And everything is kind of like, it's, it's bitter, but it's sweet. It's kind of here, right? Because everyone is alive. But then what happens? Well, 
we get sadness because Iron Giant is no longer with us. But then what happens? He assembles himself and everything is awesome again. So see what I'm trying to say. See what I'm trying to say is a good story has ups and downs. Ups and downs. But there's one thing that you have to understand that every time you have a down, you need to have a huge up and then you need to have even more down and a huge up and then you need to have like a huge down to have a huge up. Why? Because we are all about cranking the story 500% up, right? We need to have those contrasts of things. So for example, if you're doing a crazy, scary story, you know what? Make a nice, cheerful shot to have it com to compare it to something, right? So same thing with stories or story structures. Every good story has an amazing stakes and it's it's not always this or always this like even for the you know even for depressing stories right with the joker would be like well joker's depressed but he has this girl who is gonna help him out but no society is against him but no he can do this but no and see what i'm saying it could be reverse for for joker for example Right, and he's going to his demise. But every time he has a little bit of a, a little bit of a hope, he finds finds his love, you know, in the person that he speaks to. But she ain't real, you know. And then he gets his chance to talk on the talk show with with the guy of his dreams that he wanted to be on this show all the time. He's finally becoming the comedian, and boom, he gets pushed over the edge. And now he's never gonna become a comedian. He goes on the spiral of being the Joker. See. This emotional roller coaster always, um, always has to be present in your ideas and in your paintings. So, for example, I'm gonna show um, my own little project with Olaf and Gruel as an example, right? So, I have this guy, and you remember when I talked about um, the story structure, right? So you can either be world driven, right? Plot driven or character driven. So in the beginning, what did I do? I started with a kind of world piece. I had no idea who this Viking is or this monster is. I just wanted to create a cool forest Viking ish. And I wanted a monster hunter in it because I wanted like, yeah. My, my world has monster hunters, why not? And I was like, why not him not having a dog? And then when I built on top of it, I was like, well, he's trying to lure this monster into this trap and stuff like that. And then I started exploring more. What other monsters are in this world? And what other situations this monster hunter can go through with his dog? So now, even though I started with the world, I'm still kind of creating a world overall and I still have no idea who this character is because, yeah, I, I haven't drawn his face. He's just only a silhouette. But I'm slowly developing something. I'm, I'm, I'm getting some stakes. So here, see, even in this image, everything is kind of quiet and not very exciting. And then the next shot is, boom, exciting, fire, epicness, right? And then this shot is like, boom. He slingshots himself from 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 a slingshot that his feet even fly off, right? It's also exciting, but then I'm gonna have okay, let's have a relaxing moment a little bit. You know, there was there was a lot of excitement. Let's just walk for a little bit. See, contrast, emotional roller coaster, fun, exciting, not so much exciting, right? Or relaxing, just wandering around, and then a bunch of excitement. Right? Goblins are attacking this guy, right? Then the next shot is like, well, not very exciting, but with a little bit of a plot twist. Like there's a creature just, you know, just looking at the guy from the top. And then I'm like, okay, he, maybe he went through the gates. Again, not so exciting. And then oh, conflict, a baby is about to be fried. And then like, will he save him? Will he not? If this, then that. Remember, what if three spider ladies will cook a baby? Will he save him? Is it going to be something else? We don't know. Uh, and then everything is fine. So see, bad and sad and horrible, fun, 
and exciting. And after this, wholesome and cute, right? So every time when you're thinking about pairing your paintings or uh, having a few of them at the same time, think about all the things that we talked about just now, which is the emotional roller coaster, story structure, what's going in the background, how you approach your 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 story. But the main important thing, because I'm leading this up to our homework little by little, because we're going to be doing keyframes. And that's what visual development do. Visual development people do is we do keyframes or single paintings. When we're thinking about a story or what story to tell, we let's say let's have for an example uh, again let's let me let me take let's say this goblin painting um so i have this goblin painting right and it's not the greatest painting ever but when we look at it i'm like all right there's a crazy goblin and they just saw them storytelling is there but the main question is like who are these guys what led up to this point and what's going to happen after a good visual development keyframe painting or a good story t story in the painting singular or multiple is usually again see same question what if then what and this painting is not answering the question of then what and that's what makes this painting interesting you have to understand you have to raise questions answer some of them but at the same time have the audience wanting more okay so what i'm saying is is pick your moments wisely because we can come up with a story what was before that and we can come up with a story later on. And that's good storytelling because what you're starting to do is you're making your story live rent-free in another human brain, right? Why? Because they're going to say, what's going to happen next? And what the hell happened before that? Why, why are they here? Is this tribe just, you know, testing their children in this cruel way? All right, what, where does the tribe live and why? And why the goblin is there? Is she going to succeed and what's she going to kill the goblin? What's going to happen next? You know, so every little painting of yours can be a whole show, you know? And then if you have multiple frames together, you have keyframe moments from a big sequence like this right so that's what i did with olaf and gruel and now we're coming up close to your homework assignment um but before all of that i want to recap one more time from most important to the least important probably or so it just stays in your brain so first of all we as visual development artists we're storytellers we have to have an open story mind and we have to look at things through a story perspective if you look at the person ask yourself how did this person get to this place like let's say you see a hobo outside sitting down and that's the problem with being a creative voice and a storyteller when people say oh it, it sucks it's a bummer that this guy's homeless in my mind there's a whole story playing through was it a choice or was it a tragic story? What got him to this position and situation? And often I start crying when I see homeless people, you know, outside. Or especially with people with Down syndrome. I don't know why. Maybe because I can relate on some level. <laughs> but what you have to do is open your mind to questions. What did, what happened to this person that now he is here eating an ice cream? What's his name? What's he going to do next? Right? Questions, questions, questions. What's his name? What does he do? And you come up with answers in your brain. And that's how creative mind works. And when, how you observe stories. When you watch a movie or a series or play a game, what you have to do is like, wow, that's interesting. How can I use that in my world, in my story? Or you have to ask yourself, why am I responding to this situation emotionally? Why does it touch my, 
me in my heart so much? That means there's something there. And if you're going to answer the question of why does it touch me emotionally, and you're going to analyze the entire world around you through that perspective of emotion, you're going to collect a lot of interesting stories. Then you decide, all right, am I a world-driven or plot-driven or character-driven storyteller, right? And then that's where you start. And you start developing your idea. And then you, and I suggest to everybody, go watch movies, animation, and dive deep into filmmaking. Because filmmaking is story making, and story making is what our profession is. The only difference is we don't write it in words, we draw it. So, how to write scripts, how editing works, how music affects this or that. Because, you know, when I paint, I hear music, I hear dialogue, I hear a movie, I watch a movie. And then remember what I said? The only thing I have to do is press pause. And when I press pause, that's when I get my keyframe. Right, And then you think about your story, not only from a bird's eye view, from really far away, but uh, in a more specific way, you put it through a story circle, you see what your character motivation is, what your world, how your world works, what the mo most emotional core of your story is, and then you think about the most dramatic way how to tell that, the mini keyframe moments. Remember when I told you to analyze the keyframe moments from movies? That's exactly what we do. We press pause and we make sure we give a fun ride to our viewers, right? There's ups, there's sadness, and after sadness, there's hope. There's hope and then there's devastation. There's chaos and then there's order. You know, because art works this way, you know? For contrast and values, we have dark against light. For color, we have warms and cools. We have desaturated and saturated. For shape design, we have threatening, unthreatening, pointy and roundy, you know, and, and so on and so on and so on, right? So conflict or emotional roller coaster or emotional contrast. And all of this has to be happening in your brain before you even start painting. Okay? You have to understand that all of this needs to start in your brain. Because if you don't think about those things, your story is going to suck. And that's why storytellers need to be crazy sometimes. Because this is hard work. There's a lot of things to keep in mind. But again, if you train your mind and you get all of the important information over, over time, this is going to be second nature. Well, for example, my brain always comes up, comes up with random stories that I didn't ask for it to come up. I'm just sitting down and... I'm imagining why am I murdered by this grandma who's sitting to the left of me on the bus station? <laughs> why is it in my brain? I have no idea, but probably because there was a lot of training and what my brain does, it takes a puzzle, finds another puzzle, raises a question, and com comes up with a grandma murdering me on the bus. And then we have an epic fight. And then she transforms into a giant alien. And I'm actually a, a, long, a long lost son of a Martian god. And I'm protecting humanity from being destroyed. <laughs> you know? And yeah. That's how I think of story. And that's how I usually try to approach anything storytelling wise, anything visual storytelling wise. But as you can see, emotion is the main driving force of your art and of your stories. And if there's no emotion, real emotion, that means you have to go and get real emotion or start thinking consciously and mindfully that's another thing that i want to 
always point out consciously and mindfully think about why you feel in a certain way and what made you feel a certain way and you can become a great storyteller over time because i'm gonna tell you this all this structure i learned over time as i was diving into books and storytelling you know podcasts and analyzing everything else but it occurred naturally in my brain just by being mindful of what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling and why this movie sucks and this movie is good. Just by watching a huge amount of art, movies, animation, and everything else. So you personally, without even learning too in-depth of a structure, because honestly, whatever I told you right now, it already applies to you. You can become a great storyteller just by raising questions. Why does it make you feel this way? And then answering it and analyzing other people and other movies and other projects. And then over time, you will become good, first of all, at understanding yourself, what makes your soul and heart tickle. And then what you have to do is just put it in your painting, in your art. And if you'll be able to do that, that's what the story is. A story is a certain emotion that would convey through, if it's animation, through music, animation, staging, composition. If it's just in music, it's notes, progression, timbres of instruments. If it's a dance, then rhythmic gestures of your hands to music, you know. And if we're artists, it's composition, color, light, shape, etc., etc., etc. And we're going to be talking about all of those tools for the next upcoming weeks. So don't worry. But the main thing that I'm focusing on is mindful thinking and analyzing what you feel and why. And I'm going to tell you this, guys. If you'll be able to mindfully approach yourself and what you feel feeling and why and what other people are feeling and why and just this habit of raising questions it's going to become, you know, a regular state of being, just, you know, constantly raising questions and answering them for yourself in your brain, you're going to naturally become a great storyteller. And most importantly, you're going to become a better human being. Because I think right now, that's one thing that young artists that are overwhelmed with the amount of information and what they want and don't want to do is the lack of self-awareness and mindfulness mindfulnessness there's no mindfulness yeah so i think this is it for today emotion 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 that gives you an idea what story to make and that makes the story worth living if there's no emotion you feel nothing about it why do it okay don't do it unless you're just a very lazy bum and there's something in it so you just have to start doing it and then you experience the emotion depends on who you are as a person okay homework time so what you have to do for the next few weeks actually so for this week exactly you have to come up with three keyframes and those three keyframes have to answer few questions sorry they're a little bit crooked but keyframe number one keyframe number two and keyframe number three and i'm saying you have to draw them in color they have to be just sketches you can do it in black and white you can do it just with a stick figure but what you have to do is you have to come up with a story just in three frames it could be different things you can say you can base it on story structure, for example, right? So here's what my character does. Here's what happens to him. And that leads to this. So it's kind of going with our formula. What if this, then that, all right? Uh, you can say, if you want to, you can just do three keyframes of a, of a battle. You can do three keyframes of a character just going from location A to location B to location C, if you're a world-driven 
person. If you want, you can have, if you if you're able to do a still a whole plot in three frames, uh, but it's gonna be really hard. What I suggest you guys do is, here's where here's my character in his default state on frame one. Here's what happened to him, and that's what it led up to. So, for example, my example will be. There's a monster hunter guy who is looking for a monster, and then they fight! And then he emerges victorious or dies epically, right? Simple three-frame structure. It's you can you can treat it as act one, act two, and act three. And what I need you to do is just do you know stick figure dudes, you know what they're what they're doing, and write one simple um statement or um a sentence underneath you can say uh, a dragon lord is fighting a giant monster and losing for example it has to be simple on each frame just write down a sentence because this sentence will keep you um grounded and you will not try to do too many things at the same time. It's all about the simple statement. Those three keyframes need to tell one story. Like right? for example, in this keyframe here, it's a girl who's about to go on the goblet. That's it. If it's about, you know, if it's about Olaf and Gruul, those keyframes, a guy encountered a monster in the woods. A giant little pipetka is flame throwing on the Viking, the Viking is running. A Viking slingshotting himself into a giant. Giant, uh, a Viking walking, skeleton in the background laying around epically. Um, Viking wakes up, surrounded by a bunch of goblins. A Viking looks at the gate, and there's a hidden spider. Viking looking at a house. <laughs> Three spider ladies trying to fry a baby. And Viking the dog is going to his aid. A boy stole a sword from a Viking, bear chasing. Grumpy Viking, all beat up, grumpy at his little protege. They sit him by the fire. So this is the example, right? Simple, understandable. The simple statement is there. You will not get confused. And you're gonna be thinking about just and this sentence should be connected to that emotion of yours. The simple one little core, I would say it, the heart of your painting. So every time when you're doing a painting, there should be a heart of the painting, the simple statement, the simple emotion. And this, and this sentence should, um, what do you want to call it? Emphasize the heart of the painting. So you are always doing what you need to do, which is the heart, and you don't get distracted by little details here and there. Because the most the most problem that I see in young visual development artists, they because they do, and then this guy jumps off of an alien ship and then slaughters the monster in the background. There's a love triangle going out at the same time, and then the rocket explodes, and all of this is, is happening on a floating island. And there's a capsule in the background with explosions, you know. Uh, they're just trying to do too many things at the same time. So yeah, keep it simple, have fun, connect to it emotionally, most important, right? And yeah, that's part one of the homework for this week. Part two is we're going to watch Indiana Jones, uh, the first one, the first, it's Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think it's called uh yeah so what i'm gonna say is please watch indiana jones one if you want we're gonna have a watch party and um yeah we're gonna have a watch watch party um during during the week and that's all you have to do you have to watch a movie the first indiana jones with the gang during the week and come up with three keyframes that have an emotional soul in them that it tingles your soul, tickles your soul with a simple, um, 
with a, with a, with a, with a simple um, statement or a sentence underneath explaining what's happening there. It doesn't have to be too complex. You can make it black and white. You can make it stick figure like because for the rest of the camp, you're going to be painting those key three keyframes and adding the knowledge that you will get from the theory uh, lectures on how to actually paint and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, now it's time for questions and answers. I am gonna go into a live chat with you guys and we're gonna talk about it. For people who missed the live stream and missed the live chat, I'm really sorry, right? But it's all about the live interaction and live conversation. So please, next time, try not to, uh, not to, um, no, not to miss it. So yeah, hopefully you like the talk and i'll see you in the discord channel scroll everybody uh please tell your stories from the heart look at the world from your own perspective connect to it and most importantly have fun okay cheers and see you on discord